And let's bring in Rick Hassan. He's a professor at UCLA Law School. He's also the author of the book, A Real Right to Vote, How a Constitutional Amendment Can Safeguard American Democracy. Um, Rick, why do you think uh, Trump is unindicted co-conspirator number one, not indicted? And what do you think of the fact that it almost took four years to get this indictment going? Thanks for having me. I mean, the first thing I'd say is that our justice system tends to move slowly and deliberately, which generally is a pretty good thing in terms of protecting criminal defendants' rights. It's just not well-equipped to deal with attempts to subvert the outcome of a presidential election. We don't have a lot of experience with this. It took Merrick Garland a long time to bring a special prosecutor on for the federal case. The state cases proceeded state by state. I think some of the evidence that came out from Kenneth Chesbro in Wisconsin ended up providing more information that led to yesterday's indictments in Arizona. Uh, so if for Trump, he may be able to run out the clock. Uh, but for these other defendants, I think these things are going to go on for the next few years, and they might actually see some trials and some criminal convictions. Prosecutors in Michigan, Georgia, and Nevada have also brought criminal charges against some of the people who signed on as fake electors in those states. Explain why these state cases might be more successful than the federal case, ultimately. Well, you know, the federal case against uh, Trump for election uh, interference, that's the one that's on hold uh, as this immunity issue is being put out. That's only against Trump. Uh, Trump is one of many in Georgia, and Trump, as you mentioned, is not part of this in Arizona. There are different state laws that apply. So uh, in Arizona and in some of these other states, there are state fraud laws that apply. You know, here you're signing fraudulent documents saying this is an official document. Uh, that is providing who the state's slate of electors is, that might be easier to prove than some of the claims that would come on the federal level. And I think probably different calculations are being made on the federal level, just go after Trump and try and be laser focused on that. Whereas on the state level, if you go after Trump, then you face potential immunity arguments there and you make the case more complicated. So I, uh, prosecutors have discretion, but they also have to be realistic about getting these cases to trial and actually getting some jury to make a determination about them. Let's turn to the major arguments in the U.S. Supreme Court today. How likely do you think it is that the Supreme Court will end up delaying this trial beyond the November election based on what you heard today from the justices? Well, they already delayed it a lot. I don't know if you remember, but Jack Smith, the uh, special counsel, tried to get the court to intervene before the D.C. Circuit back in December. The court said no. Then when the court set this for argument, they gave a two-month window for it. Now we'll probably wait another two months for a decision. The justices seemed somewhat divided today. I think it's really unlikely we would see a decision before the end of June, the beginning of July. And that decision is likely going to split the baby. It's going to result in a remand where there's going to be more work for the lower courts to do. I would be very surprised to see Donald Trump uh, go to trial before the November election at this point. All right, UCLA law professor Rick Hassan, thank you so much. Good to see you. We'll be right back.